Amen. That was great, choir. You never disappoint us. Never do. So thank you so much. And Kathy, Joy, thank you so much. We enjoyed that song. How did you get all those words in? <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. If you're uh, visiting with us from out of town, you may not be aware of the fact that here in the last several weeks, we've been having some storms around here. It's been a busy season, to say the least. And about three weeks ago, we had a storm come through that produced winds in excess of 80 miles an hour, and it was exciting to look outside and see trees sideways, and it was pretty exciting uh, down on the square, wasn't it, eh, uh, Debbie? <laughs> As roofs were levitating. It wasn't funny, though. It was tragic, actually. Uh, uh, trees down, cars smashed, all kinds of chaos. And that was a storm. And there have been plenty of other storms all across our nation. And when it comes to storms, they produce casualties and chaos all over the place. Today we're going to be looking at storms and crises that come but we're not going to be talking about those of a physical kind. We're going to be talking about those of a emotional and spiritual kind. So today, if you've got your Bibles, please open them to Acts, the 27th chapter. On the screen, we'll be having, we, we will be having verses for you to follow along. But we're going to be talking about the storm that the Apostle Paul faced and how he dealt with it and how that it is a picture for us about how that we can deal with with storms and have confidence in the midst of crisis. So let's just jump into this, and but before we jump into it, let me give you a quick background, and that is that leading up to chapter 27, Paul had been preaching the gospel. He had been imprisoned for preaching the gospel. He'd appeared before King Agrippa and Governor uh, Felix, and they had said to him, Paul, they had said to the accusers, we don't see anything wrong with this guy. You, you're really making false accusations. But Paul appealed to them and he said, I want to go to Rome and I want to appeal to Caesar because I'm a Roman soldier, uh, I'm a Roman citizen. Therefore, I deserve a hearing before them. And so Governor uh, Felix and, Gov and King Agrippa said, well, you want to go to Rome? To Rome you shall go. So therefore, there were soldiers that were assigned to him, and they made a journey. They began their journey to Rome, and they had to get on board a ship. Interesting to see how that not only it was Paul, but it was his entourage. He had the writer of the book of Acts, which is the physician, Dr. Luke, and then there were several others that went along with him. But Paul was the one who was being guarded by the Roman soldiers. With that in mind, let's... Uh, Let's see what happens. They get on board a ship, and it says in verse 5, When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Caesarea and Pamphylia, we landed at Myrens and Lyca. Then the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty, arriving off of Snidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete opposite Salome. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because now it was after the fast. Now, the fast refers to the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, according to the lunar calendar, is always a time during uh, either sometime in mid-September uh, mid into October. So the Day of Atonement was always a day of fasting. It was a national day of remembrance for what God was doing. So it says, after the fast, the Day of Atonement, Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to shipping cargo and to our lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. And we'll stop there for right now. Let me just give a quick introduction about storm. Someone has said very prophetically, they have said this, you're either in a storm or you've just come out of a storm 
or unbeknownst to you, you are getting ready to go into a storm sometime in the future. It's just the way it is in this life here on this earth. Well, when it comes to storms, there are several different sources and reasons for them. By introduction, let me just say that there are four types of storms, basically. The first one would be the ones that are caused by Satan. Satan will cause storms. I mean, he'll kick up dust. He'll stir up trouble. He'll cause all kinds of chaos and confusion and bring all kinds of problems into people's lives. In fact, I think that the storm that we're facing today in America is satanically inspired. When we see all the chaos that's going on all across our nation, and it just seems as if everything is in a turmoil, I have no doubt about it that behind all of this chaos and all of this weakness that's going on in Washington and in our borders and uh, as far as diplomacy and all the trouble that's taking place, I believe that the enemy is using weak-minded people to stir up and cause and bring about this storm, and God's people better be getting shelter and trusting in the Lord. I'll tell you that for the future. But the storms that Satan will cause on a national scale and on a much smaller scale, of course. Then there are the ones that we cause. How many of you have, all, have ever brought a hurricane into your own life? Don't raise your hand. How many of you have ever, you know, said, man, I left a tornado behind me there. Whoa, why did I ever say that? What was I thinking when I made that decision? Oh, if only I could pull back and go back in time and retreat and retrieve some of those things that I've done. We cause our own storms. You ever look back in memories and go, man, mm, mm, mm. that was a bad idea at the time third one would be the ones that God allows. Some things are father filtered through his divine fingers. He allows things to come into our life. We, we, we can't plan for them, but God in his foreknowledge, he knows about them. He knows what's going to come our way, and it is a work that he can do that we can't understand, but he will do. And we're going to talk more about the purpose behind them in just a minute. And then there are those that other people cause. Other people will bring storms into your life either through selfishness or maybe they just accidentally bring it or it's just the nature of their life. They, maybe they just like drama or some just, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. But storms can be brought into your life by other people. Now, in this case, this story that we're going to look at, the storm that we're seeing here, the Lord has allowed it and others have made it worse. All right? So let's look at the rest of the story about what's going on here. What will happen when it comes to a crisis? And how, how can God give us confidence in the midst of these crises? Well, first of all, we've got to be aware of wrong decisions that will come our way. Wrong decisions and reactions to a crisis. What are some of those wrong decisions? Well, here's what happens here. The Bible says in verse 10 that Paul tried to talk to the people that were in charge. So... The first thing is that we've got to be careful when it comes to listening to the experts. Listening to the experts. Paul tried to talk to the owner of the ship, and he also talked with the centurion, which would be the man who was in charge of the Roman soldiers that were guarding him. He said, don't think it's a good idea. Don't think it's a good idea. But they were the experts, especially the owner. Don't think it's a good idea. They wouldn't listen to him. Now, this is, not, uh, this is not advice coming from me about don't ever listen to your mechanic, your physician, or your contractor, or your plumber, okay? I'm not saying ignore what other people have to say when it comes to things that you're dealing with. But understand also that the expert is not always right about everything. There is this thing called the divine hand of God and what he wants to do. And we can't we can't understand why and how that he will move into the situation and bring about a work that we cannot make for ourselves. Uh, one time, uh, I've gotten a lot of expert advice over the years, and uh, so there was this one person who was supposed to be an expert, and he said to me, this was years ago, about 15 years ago, he said, you know, I just can't see Walmart going any further. 
I, I, I just think you ought to buy, uh, I think you ought to buy Kmart stock. And I said to myself, man, I wish I had some money. I could buy me some Kmart stock. Well, you know what would have happened to that money? <laughs> it would have taken wings of a dove and flown away. But at the time, that sounded like a good idea. Sometimes the expert is wrong. And when they looked at Paul, they said, who are you? You're a Baptist preacher. What do you know? What did Paul know? I mean, what did Paul know? I tend to think that Paul knew some basic things that they weren't aware of. The Bible says that Paul said, I've been, in his confession, he said, I've been, I have been shipwrecked three times. And I think maybe in this story, he had already been through it twice. So he already knew what a shipwreck looked like. And he probably, from, from knowledge, had said, this is not a good situation. But what else did he know? Did he know? He knew what it was for God to give him warning. I mean, who was Paul? He was a man that was divinely anointed of God who walked and talked with God. I mean, it was the Lord that knocked him off of his high horse and called him to be a preacher of the gospel. It was the Lord who had miraculously delivered him from death. It was Paul who had preached the gospel where no one else has preached. It was Paul who had literally prayed over people and they were healed, prayed over people and they were raised from the dead. Who was this nobody? He was a somebody that knew the Lord God Jehovah. And I'll tell you what, I'll take a person that truly knows God and walks and talks with God than I will anybody that is an expert in what the world has to offer. Because you see, there is a wisdom and a knowledge that comes from the heart of God that is superior to anything that can come to the mind of man. So be careful when it comes to listening to the expert. The second thing is this, be be careful in the danger of taking a vote. That's what happened here. It says that they got together and they were outnumbered. Paul was outnumbered two to one. What happens when you take a vote? Well, people, and this is not against taking a vote. I mean, I, I meet with the deacons every month and we take votes. We have a business meeting tonight, we will take a vote. But what I'm trying to say is oftentimes when we get in the midst of a storm now, in the midst of a storm, there will be those who have the vote going on what, is, what looks like obvious. And all, oftentimes what will happen is you're under pressure. we got to do something. They were a month behind schedule in getting Paul to Rome. If they stayed where they were, they were going to be three months in that harbor. And the centurion said, he may have said, look, I, I'm going to be, uh, my, uh, my, the men under my command uh, and, the, and who I'm under, they're going to be long gone. Maybe they're going to Spain or somewhere. And how am I ever going to get there? I've got to get this fella, whoever he is, Paul, I've got to get him off the ship and to Rome. And the owner of the ship said, we stay in this harbor. I'm going to lose money. And if we stay here, this is not going to be good for my business. I'm probably going to go into bankruptcy. So there were probably a lot of pressures behind all of this. We've got to do something. There's that pressure behind it when it comes to, quote, taking a vote in the midst of a storm. So oftentimes we, we will try and do things in the natural way. So those are some of the things that are wrong reactions. But what are some of the dangers that come along in a crisis? Look what it says in verse 13. A gentle south wind began to blow, and they thought they had obtained what they wanted, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, though, a hurricane force wind called a northeastern swept down the island. The ship was caught by the storm. They could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. And as we passed the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. They had a dinghy or a lifeboat that followed behind to go to the shore to get supplies and other times, of course, in times of danger and distress. So here they are, and now they are no longer sailing. They are drifting. What are some of the dangers in the times of a crisis and storm to take away the confidence that God wants to give to us? It is the danger of drifting. The danger of drifting, to go as normal, to try and make life as normal as it is and not consult the hand of God to just drift along with life, hoping that whatever storm it is that will blow over and things can get back to normal. 
there's the danger of drifting. These sailors may have said, maybe this is not going to last so long. Maybe it's just going to blow over. And it didn't. The second danger is not only the danger of drifting, but there's the danger of discarding. They began to throw things overboard and abandon what they had. In verse 18 and 19, skip down to there. It says, so they, uh, we took the violent battering from the storm and began to throw car, uh, cargo overboard on the third day, threw the ship's tackle overboard, uh, and all was darkness in front of them. So there is the discarding and the throwing overboard. And what gets thrown overboard oftentimes in a storm is this, consulting with God. What does God have to say? What is he wanting to speak to your heart about? What is he doing? And there is the throwing overboard. I don't, we don't, I know what other people say. Business is business. Family is family. Church is church. We don't need to mix the three together. We don't need to get all involved like that because you know you got to do what you got to do to preserve yourself, to take care of yourself. And so the whole idea of going with what God could do and crying out to Him for His supernatural work of wisdom and guidance, well, let's just toss that overboard. You see, in the midst of the storm, God is doing a work that cannot be done otherwise. We want life to be normal. We want it to be good. We don't want the problems. I vote for that kind of a life. I'm not looking for storms, not chasing them. I'm not a storm chaser. I like to watch them on TV. That's as close as a tornado as I want to get. Amen. You know what I'm saying? I'm not interested in getting any closer than a TV screen when it comes to a tornado. But there are storms and hurricanes that can teach us a lot in life. You take like a, you take like a jeweler. A jeweler will take a piece of rock out of the ground and under his expert eye with a big magnifying glass and the light, he will take a small hammer and chisel and he will begin to peck away at the diamond or whatever precious stone that it is. And he will chip away so that he can reveal and unveil the beautiful diamond that's there. Now, that's our lives as God is chipping away. Through trial, heartache, pain, and storms. He's chipping away with his little jeweler's hammer. But some of us, you know, we're we're kind of stubborn and obstinate. And what God has to do, instead of using the jeweler's hammer, he uses another hammer, and that's called a carpenter's hammer. And where he has to go, okay, (laughs) start pounding away. I'm wanting to build your life. I'm wanting to do something with your life. And so... He uses a carpenter's hammer. But some of us, and notice I'm putting us in the midst of that sentence, some of us are more hard-hearted, so what's the next hammer that he uses? A sledgehammer. (laughs) And it's more like, whack. (laughs) Let's knock these walls down. Whack. Let's, Let's make a new room here. No, God, I don't want that. And he uses a sledgehammer. That may be like the hurricane. But then there's another hammer. If you're truly a child of God, and if you truly belong to him, he's not going to give up. He may say, the uh, jeweler's hammer's not working, the carpenter's hammer's not working, the sledgehammer's not working. I got one more. It's called a jackhammer. And I mean, he starts just, he'll, he'll just allow your life to be all busted up. Because he's more interested in building your life than making everything at ease and nice and peaceful. Because he knows that the enemy can take that wonderful peace that you're elusively looking for and the enemy can use it and build and make his own garden of evil in it. So the Lord will do what he can to get our attention in order to do his work. And when we discard what God wants to do, he says, well, let's just find another hammer in order to do the work. So there is the discarding that goes on. But then there is the despair. In this verse of Scripture, the Bible says that they began to despair and give up and think that all was loss. In verse 20 it says, We finally gave up all hope of being saved. But Paul knew that God was at work. We're about to find out why. You see, God will allow the despair 
because he's doing a greater work than we can imagine. Number one, you remember how that Joseph was in jail? Don't you know there were times of despair, but God was at work. God could have kept him out of jail. Daniel was in the lion's den. God could have kept Daniel from being thrown in the lion's den. Jeremiah was in the bottom of the well. God could have kept him from going to the bottom of the well. Paul was in prison, but God could have kept him from going to prison. Peter was in prison, but God could have kept Peter from going to prison. On and on I go because the Lord knows that what he's building is a wall of confidence that no man can build for themselves. And it is his work, not our work, that he does. Now, so the despair we see here is the next thing that we see is proper response in the midst of a crisis. What is the proper response in the midst of a crisis? It says, after we had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up and said, You should have listened to me, men, and taken my advice and not set sail from Crete. Then you would, not have, uh, you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Now get this. Only the ship will be destroyed, verse 23, last night. Last night, an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, this angel stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Then Paul says, So take courage. Take courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. So Paul, with confidence, stands before them. What is our proper response? We look for the Lord's presence. We look for the Lord's presence. Paul didn't know where God was going to show up and how he was going to show up, but he knew the Lord was going to show up. He said this, Lord, the storm is raging, but it hadn't caught you by surprise. God, you're on your throne, but not all is lost. Lord Jesus, you've taken me through this before. I'll know you'll take me through it again. So the angel of the Lord appeared to him and spoke directly to him. Folks, listen, I I just want to tell you, and I want you to remember this, and, and take this with you. Take it with you when you go to the Lord in prayer. Take it with you when you are fighting the battle. That it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how dark the night is, that the Lord really is still there. It it does not matter how great the obstacle is, God is greater than the obstacle. It, It does not matter if everyone else votes no, if God has said yes, that's the only vote that counts. It, it, it really does not matter. It really does not matter that if the end of all things is at hand, He has promised He will never leave you nor forsake you. It does not matter that if all your strength is lost and it seems like you are losing everything, including your mind, here's what the Lord says. He says this, If you'll mount, if you'll wait on me, and if you'll trust in me, you'll mount on wings of eagles. You'll run and not be weary. You'll walk and not faint because I'm with you. So it is not a matter of what the circumstances are. It is a matter of who the Lord God is to you. And if when he is real to you, everything else, no matter how great it is, how black it is, or how dark it is, or how strong it is. Everything else is inferior. Everything else is secondary. Everything else melts in the presence of the Lord. And you can have that confidence. You may say, but, but my confidence is not there because of who I am. It is not based upon who you are. I am weak, you say. I've been away from the Lord. It, it has no indication about where and how you are in your walk when you look for the presence of the Lord and truly come before Him. He, get this, more than you need and want his presence, he wants to bring his presence to you if you'll open your eyes. 
If you'll open your heart, he'll come and bring the confidence and the strength that you really need. You look for the presence of the Lord, and that's what Paul said. The angel of the Lord appeared, and he said, you're going to be saved. Everybody else is on, on the ship is going to be saved. Don't worry. I'm going to see to it that you're going to get to Rome, even though it looks impossible. God is at work. The next thing that we see about the proper response is we look for God's direction. We look for his direction. God is at work. And in verse 24, he said, he said, keep up your courage. And you know, it's, it's infectious. When other people are confident in the Lord, it, it breeds and oozes out to others. Confidence goes out to others. So look for God's direction. He said, here's the direction. Trust in the Lord. Here's, I think here's what happened. I think that on board that ship, they thought they were going to die. And so who did they start listening to? The Apostle Paul. They didn't want to hear him at the beginning, but the worse that hurricane was, I believe they were like, hey, Paul, uh, tell us a little bit more about this Damascus Road experience. Uh, Luke, uh, we've heard that people have been raised from the dead by your friend here. Is it really true? Uh, what about this Jesus? Uh, by the way, he says that uh, he'll give eternal life. Uh, and that he who believes in him, though he were dead, will, yet will he live forevermore. It looks like we're going to die. Can you tell us about this Jesus that you worship? I believe that by the time they got to this point, he had a whole church full of converts on board that ship. They were all ready and willing to listen to what he had to say. And they had the experience of receiving Christ as their Savior. So he stands before them confidently. And the rest of the story is the shipwreck that takes place. You can read it, uh, the rest of the story. Uh, go home this afternoon and just through new eyes, I pray that you'll read chapter 27. One of the most exciting, as far as stories goes, it's one of the most exciting stories, chapter 27 and 28, that you'll read in the Bible. He says in verse 37, altogether there were 276 on board. The third thing would be this, look for God's promises. I promise you this, God's not wasting the storm. He is not wasting the crisis that you face. And I know some of you right now, I know some of you are going through a crisis and it seems as if the hurricane is blowing and life is being blown apart. Look for God's promises. He's not wasting this. He is not. I told this story in the first service. Word got out. Uh, so I guess I'm going to tell it again the second service. Most of you know that my wife is a wonderful cook. Uh, when she and Sheila were working together, uh, they, were, they were quite a tag team. But uh, when, when my wife and I first got married, uh, she really didn't know that much about cooking, but she, she really pursued after that and, and became a great cook. And I'm, I have enjoyed her meals. <laughs> I'm one of her biggest cheerleaders. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and it's just about every day. I'm like, man, that's good. I like it. I like it. But you know, there's something I've noticed about that she'll do. I, I don't cook. I can't even microwave a, a, a pot pie. I, I, that's how bad I am, I'm telling you. But uh, so she cooks, and I'm always amazed at what she produces. Now, if I go into the kitchen and sit at the uh, breakfast bar and I say to her, uh, what are you going to cook? She says, well, here, let me, let me show you, and I want you, to, I want you to taste it. And so she, she brings out a pan of flour. Now, and she says, here, have a bite. I'm going to go, oh, I, don't, I, don't want any, I don't want any flour. And then she brings out, you know, a tablespoon of salt. And she says, here, have some salt. I'm like, I like a little bit, but not a whole tablespoon. Here, what about some, I don't know, baking powder? Have a tablespoon, tablespoon of this. Don't, 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 don't want that. Oh, well, here's some sugar. Yeah. All right, I'll take some of that. That's, that's good. Here, drink you about a fourth of a cup of vegetable oil. You'll really like that. And I'm like, no, don't want any of it except maybe the sugar and maybe a little bit of the milk you put in. But the rest of it, you can keep for yourself. Well, what does she do? Oh, and she says, here. Want some eggs? I said, you know how I am about eggs. Chicken eggs. I mean, I like chicken eggs. She says she cracks them open, 
And she says, you like the movie Rocky? Go ahead and drink them. I go, I'm not drinking raw eggs. That's just not going to happen. So what does she do, though? She puts it all together. And then the magic begins. <laughs> As she stirs it all up, and she puts it in the oven, and it comes out, and it's something wonderful like the other day. We had cherry cobbler. Can I say Amen. <laughs> It was delicious. In fact, I had, I had a bite of it, a little bit that was left this morning as I walked out the door. Uh, it's Breakfast of Champions, by the way. <laughs> and what's going on is that's in the oven, and it's baking. It's all put together, and the heat is bringing it together. That's like a crisis in our life. God is taking that which we say, this is distasteful, and this is bad, and this is awful, and this is okay, I can tolerate it, but why is this going on? And somehow, miraculously, God is putting it all together, and He's not wasting a bit of it. He's not going to waste any of it, as He's baking and making and working that which is beautiful and wonderful in your life. You can't see it at the time, and it tastes terrible at the time. You want to spit it out and get rid of it and never see it again. God says, I can take it and make it wonderful in my sight. Trust me, though. Don't trust in yourself. Here's what happened. Can you believe Paul, the Lord through Paul, took a shipwreck and made it the most incredible, wonderful story? The ship did go aground. It did break up. And they all had to either grab hold of something and float or they had to swim. But all 276 survived and got to shore. And God was glorified in the midst. He's doing more than we can ever imagine or think. Confidence, not in ourself, but confidence in the midst of crisis. How I pray, how I pray that you'll have the confidence not in yourself, but in the Lord. Now, let's talk to the Lord about this right now, okay? Let's pray. If you'll have your confidence not in yourself, but in the Lord, a whole lot more will be accomplished. So would you today place your trust in Him? What confidence do you have of getting to heaven in your own strength? My good works and my best church attendance won't get me one foot closer to heaven. But I'll tell you this, the saving blood of Christ and the cleansing of sins will bring salvation to me and immediately the Lord will write my name in the Lamb's book of life. And He did that years ago and He'll do it for you. I have that confidence and you can too. If you've never given your heart to Christ, you can. What confidence do you have for tomorrow and the strength that you need to face whatever's in front of you. If your confidence is not in the Lord, then you're going to keep getting what you're getting. And I'm going to wager to guess that it's been real unsatisfactory. Oh, you've got to, you've got to come to the Lord and trust in Him. I pray today if there are those who need and want to make a public profession of faith and make an appointment about baptism, that you'll come because God wants you to declare to the world, I'm not ashamed to belong to Jesus. I want to be baptized. Or he's speaking to you about the church and being involved in this church by membership. But you know, I can only imagine that there are those who just are having heartache with storm. I want you to talk to the Lord during this time and say, Lord, I'm sailing with you, and right now it looks like the ship is going to break up. But you've promised that you'll get me to shore, and I'm going to trust in you. Would you do that today? Trust in Him. I want us to just have a time of invitation, because I believe that, and I, I just believe that there are those who really need to talk to the Lord about a crisis or a storm. Either that, or you know someone who is going through that. Would you be in prayer for them? Or if there are other decisions that need to be made, would you come right now? Come right now. Father, we pray for those who need to come right now for salvation, membership, 
praying at the altar, whatever it is, Lord, we pray right now your will be done. Come right now. Come home. God bless you for being here. Thank you. For those of you that are visiting with us, we're grateful that you're here. And we pray you felt the presence of the Lord and the fellowship of the saints. And if we can minister in any way, please let me know. And we do have one that's come. All right, hang on just a second. Cliff, I think we have some announcements to make, and then I'll introduce uh, Brother Gail uh, to us. We have uh, several announcements. If you still have your bulletin out, uh, we have several things going on this week. <clears throat> First, this afternoon, we have um, quite a few activities. Today at 2 o'clock, uh, Truett and Mandy Williams will be here. Um, and uh, Are they here now? Did I ever see them? Back there in the back. Hey, guys. Hey, Miss Sarah. They're, they're going to have a gift tea. They uh, uh, recently married in Missouri, and, uh, and our church is uh, going to have a tea for them today at 2 o'clock. And, uh, and we would love for you to come be a part of that and just uh, support them, show a little love for them. As uh, you, Some of you remember what it was like to be newly married. That was a long time ago for some of you. Um, and so that tea will be today at 2 o'clock here in the Commons. And then at 4.30, we're asking all of our uh, ordained men, uh, deacons, active, inactive deacons, to come and support uh, Brother John Cook. John Cook is, uh, has accepted, or I guess he's in view of a call today, um, uh, at a church at Walnut Ridge, Arkansas. And, uh, and we wanted to ordain him before he goes uh, and works full-time at that church. And, and so if you can be a part of that ordination council today at 430, and then uh, we'll have business meeting tonight, and then right after business meeting is over, I believe we will um, uh, have that ordination service for him. So all of our active, inactive, ordained men, we would love for you to really come be a part of this and support John as he's about to um, jump into full-time ministry. Oof. Um, and then uh, the last thing, next Saturday, is uh, Mission Covington. Mission Covington is uh, it's the core of who we are. It's one of our core values here at First Baptist Church as we would try to make a difference here where we live. Um, and so uh, what we're going to do next Saturday is we're going to meet here at 7 o'clock here in the Commons. I know that's early. And we'll have a light breakfast, donuts, coffee, and things like that to kind of get your motor going. And, uh, and we have about four uh, yard work uh, jobs that include uh, raking leaves, um, trimming bushes, um, just a lot of odds and ends. A, lot, a couple of them are for senior adults in our church who just can't do it anymore. It's just kind of difficult. And then there's a couple of jobs uh, that we got their contact information from the Tipton County uh, Aging Commission. I think that's right. Um, but uh, we, we kind of put word out uh, through one of our church members. She really helped us out and uh, got an email not long ago but after they, they realized we were going to help out one of their um, participants they said it's just so great that first baptist church 
is interested in helping people like this. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're just trying to show God's love uh, in, in, in tangible ways. Maybe yard work's not your thing. Yard work's not my thing. Uh, but uh, maybe yard work's not your thing. Well, we're gonna, it's our goal to serve 120 meals Saturday as well. We have three apartment complexes, Fox Hollow, Glendale, are kind of the two retirement places right up here on uh, Mueller Brass or Hastings Way. And then we're also going to deliver uh, meals to uh, another apartment complex uh, uh, just around the corner as well. So uh, 120 meals and about four or five yard work projects, all that will be done probably from about 7.30 to, to 11 or 12. We'll be done by lunch. Uh, we're just asking if you will come and if you have some tools that, that you can come and help us be, uh, use, that would be wonderful. Bring your kids, bring everybody. There are literally jobs that everybody can do, and we're just asking for a very minimum, minimal uh, uh, just commitment from about 7 to 12 or so, and we'd love for you to be a part of that. We know that there's two Sunday school classes that are doing socials that afternoon. One's a, kind of a goodbye party for John Cook, and I know the Stewart's class is also doing one. We'll be done in plenty of time to get cleaned up and go to that as well, so... That's what's going on. That is great. And then also next, uh, next Sunday, we are going to be having a baptismal out in the lake slash pond, whichever one you call it. And so we've got about 12 to 15 people that are lined up. And yes, the water is ready. So uh, be sure and take your tetanus shot, though, before you get baptized. <laughs> No, 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 it's, it's, it's going to be fine. It really will be. But uh, it's, we're, I'm looking forward to that. And then also next Sunday night, su Sunday afternoon at 4.30 baptism, then at 5 o'clock we'll have our fish fry at the uh, pavilion. So it's going to be a great day. Now tonight at our business meeting, we're going to be voting on the parking lot. And so, you know, if you care about that, you want to be here for uh, voting the parking lot here on the west side, it's going to be around $160,000 and Already uh, almost a third of that has been pledged as far as payment towards it go. Can I say hear an amen on that? So uh, uh, that makes it a little bit easier in my boat to, uh, as far as thinking about that. So uh, that's going to be coming up tonight as far as reports on some future things as well. I'm so delighted to share with you. This is Mr. Gail Ralph. Mr. Gail, if you'll come up here and stand. Tommy, if you'll stand beside him too. Uh, Mr. Ralph has been visiting with us now for what, about the last six or eight months? And uh, he and I visited on several occasions, and he comes for several different reasons. Number one, he comes, of course, asking for membership in the church, requesting that. He also comes uh, committing his life in a new way to the Lord and also uh, to follow the Lord in baptism. He has been baptized before, but he said... That was a few years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, and he says, I just, I feel the new need. Now, do you want to be baptized here or out there in the lake? He's got to, he said, I got to go to the lake. All right. So uh, uh, he'll be another one we'll be adding to that. Tommy, thank you. And others who have been uh, friending him and, and speaking with him. If you rejoice in this decision that he's made, would you let me know by saying amen? Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Glad to have you, brother. All right. Let's bow in prayer as we go, and then you want to come by and give him the right hand of Christian fellowship. Father, thank you for bringing Mr. Ralph our way, and thank you for this new commitment that he's made to you. And Lord, I pray that you'll just be with us as we go. Lord, we know that there are many that we can pray for as we go. Give us hearts of prayer and intercession for them, for it's in your name that we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Amen.